odd bits that are still left for us to kind of like figure out functionally wise. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's, we've, God, there's so much stuff. This, I have so many questions for you. It's, it's just unreal. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go. Let's, you know, I just, uh, you know, um, so, so like I said to you, you know, you take the standard and you apply it on an enterprise level problem. And this is where, you know, things start to get very interesting. Uh, but also more importantly, you can think about, you know, the kind of, you know, boundaries you're pushing, you know, beyond the familiar, because each and every one of us, software in general, it does seem to be similar in general, but each and every one of us has their own scenario. And I'm just trying to find these scenarios, standardize these scenarios and kind of push them back to the to the general public. Ah, there he is. Oh, yeah. this, guy, this guy still doesn't have a camera. I still have a camera. Thank oh, you. there you are. This is actually the very first time I see you. I've <laughs> I know. never seen you before, dude. You know, and, <laughs> you know, <laughs> anyway, how are you doing, Calm? I'm good. Yourself? Pretty good. Hey, guys, you want to see a nice trick? Do you see this? Yep. Okay, this is, this is Pepsi, right? This is how I open them up. Jesus Christ, man. Oh, I, do, I do that all the time. Makes my I've friends never, cringe. I've never been to a dentist once in my life. Yeah. <laughs> so, so that's why you need a civic teeth so you can open bottles with your teeth. That's, that's exactly right. <laughs> Listen, if you get the I, standard wrong, he eats you. I, I, I have to tell you both two things, too. You know, you, like... The stuff that you're doing, taking the engineering standard and applying it and rewriting your entire system according to it. I'm looking at the chats and the, the threads that are going on. For the most part, people used to come in and ask questions, and I have to come back and answer them. But now you guys are living these experiences. And you're actually trying to help people out there. I'm very grateful for that. I want you both to know that, you know, because... I do sleep four hours a day, but even then, people still ask questions during these times. So it really, really helps that someone living in a different time zone that's basically <laughs> saying, no, you know, as soon as I saw Callum today saying, no, wait, coordinations is an orchestration of orchestrations. That just made me happy. I just saw that. I was like, <laughs> okay, people get it. <laughs> they get the idea. Anyway, happy to have you both. Tell me what you're up to. Callum's your shadow, man. Like. Every time I mention anything to do with the standard, he's like, well, no, actually, on this particular page of the standard, Hassan wrote this, and I'm like, Let okay. me stop. <laughs> do, do you know when I'm going to be the happiest? When someone comes up to me and tries to explain the standard to me, not knowing at all, you know, that this is a thing that I've been a part of. I was just telling my friend Joshua this the other day. I said, He said to me, when are you going to stop? Because you keep, you know, putting all this content out there. I said to him, the moment someone comes up to me and say, hey, let me show you this really cool thing that helps you build simple software. That's the point where I'd be like, yep, that's it. My job is done. It's completely separated, decoupled, you know, and people are actually able to kind of evolve it. You have no idea how many, like, people come to me almost every day and they say, can we upgrade this piece? Can we upgrade this piece? Can we change this piece? You know, this last storage broker upgrade, I'm really happy about. But I think doing it with the B2B context, the way you're doing it, is okay, too. I think this is what exceptions should be. You know, mm -hmm. I, I think this is what exception is supposed to be. It's supposed to be, you know, something that simplifies the craziness of the entity framework. But anyway, how are you guys doing? What time is it over there? Is it like 4 o'clock or something? 4 o'clock in the afternoon, yeah. Okay, let's, let's, let's talk. Let's talk architecture. <laughs> And I'll I'll drink Pepsi and we'll have fun, you know. <laughs> at, at like seven in the morning for no reason. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay. So I don't know where where do you want to pick up, man? Because uh, I'm thinking like we covered a lot in the previous sort of long session. What I don't want to do is do like another five hour long session. Five hour but, session. But I yeah. do have a lot of like stuff that perhaps we should go through like in pieces maybe yeah we should uh, aim for 10 hours so. yeah we should. <laughs> they're <laughs> never long enough <laughs> hassan doesn't good. need sleep anyway he just told us right i don't need sleep sleep is overrated you know my dad um you know my dad passed away but one of the things he would joke about would be like ah oh, you're gonna sleep someday for a long time so don't worry about that part <laughs> no sleeping is there you know paul i'm looking at this right here 
let's see. I'm looking at this piece here. Oh my God. It's like you're designing a, a board, like a circuit. But the beautiful thing about this is if you drop a junior engineer in the middle of this and say, hey, go ahead and update this new feature, it'll take them seconds to kind of understand, you know, where to go and what exactly to do. So we're preferring, we're preferring the, the, the replication across the board rather than doing smart code that is only good to write, but very hard to read and understand. So there is that. Anyway, so, so last time we talked, Paul, last time you were talking about, you said you have some questions about security or something like that, right? Was that was that where you guys at? So, yeah. So what we did was um, when we first started implementing the standard, uh, we had our conversation. We talked about like because of the nature of our solution being kind of you know very enterprisey in in nature, and the, effectively that what we're building. Um, you don't really want to be constrained by the length of a HTTP request mm -hmm. um, if you're going to try and kind of do everything in a sort of single threaded manner. Right. So if you can farm everything out across as many sort of threads and connections to your, your SQL server as possible and, and then leverage effectively the power that you get from being in the cloud, mm -hmm. then you can essentially do the same workload in a fraction of the time. Right. And so we came up with this kind of, cul-de-sac at scale model which would allow us to go down one cul-de-sac for the the basic kind of if you like request life cycle that most people associate you know having a um a http endpoint with mm -hmm. um but then so in our case uh what we're doing is we're accepting large quantities of um serialized data in uh, a csv format um, which is a standard that myself and and callum have have built yeah. over time nice. through sort of negotiation with our clients. Um, nice. As long as our clients can kind of meet that basic requirement for, you know, the CSV standard is like, you know, it's like a 12 column file or something. Um, yeah. We can do effectively their entire business process and run an entire kind of solution for them from that. Nice. Nice. So, yeah, it, it's a nice uh, way to basically say, hey, look, we realize you're, your business is extremely complicated, but if you can dumb it down to these 12 values for um, what is essentially a transaction line, um, off the back of that, we'll handle everything, um, which is, yeah, it's a great thing to be able to go back to your client and say. Now, obviously, because we're receiving serialized data like this, we're getting flat data sets. And what we need to do is firstly kind of parse that information and then um, build from that effectively an entity tree mm. um, and the entity tree uh, according to the standard you know you have a cul-de-sac effectively for each entity type so in the case of um, an invoice uh, we have a header you have a collection of lines mm -hmm. um, invoices can have a collection of, of references mm -hmm. um, and we have companies basically the transactions that we're dealing with are all um some buyer company some supplier company so a supplier right. is selling some products to a buyer so it's right. b2b transactions effectively um and the nature of what we do um we're in sort of supply chain finance but it's the the funding aspect of it so there's this third party funder um which again we talked a lot about this in our last session mm -hmm. Um, so you've got a collection of companies and due to the way that um, our security model and, and sort of our system works, what we effectively do is for each uh, client that we have, we build out something called a bucket tree, which is akin to think of it as kind of like a, um, a document management systems type sort of folder structure. And what we can do is we can grant subsets of users access to different folders. Mm -hmm. um, what we're kind of doing is we create a bucket for each company, essentially, and every invoice that references that company, we put the invoice in that bucket. So an invoice can effectively appear in multiple places, but in our system, it's only put in, in the system once, essentially, and then it's kind of shared out to all these different people. Um, Paul, Paul, I have a question for you. Is this all offline? Like, there is no user waiting on the other side, right? Like when a request like that comes in, like a CSV file, 
the person yeah. that's uploading that CSV file, whether it's standardized or not, you, you told me you do your very best, which is strange yeah. to me. It's crazy, but I understand. I understand where you're coming from. You're trying to process as much as you can, you know, mm -hmm. and anything else that's not good or not standardized, doesn't follow your standard for the CSV files. You basically spit out an error. Are you expecting the user to be sitting on the other side? waiting for the response to come out. This is what we call online process versus offline. Absolutely not. Okay. Absolutely not. No. So, okay, there, so there's... Offline. Oh, okay. That, oh my God. That makes things so much simpler. Okay. Keep going. Shut so it the, there's Go different parts to the process. Okay. Uh -huh. So when we get further down the line and the finance entity gets involved and there's an offer generated, the user can get involved in accepting the offer. Um, mm -hmm. But essentially the act of our client who's usually on the buyer side of these transactions, streaming the data to us, what they effectively have is like an overnight reporting process that they run on their end mm -hmm. that generates um, a transaction set effectively in our CSV format and then throws it at our API. Mm -hmm. um, to give you an idea, when I, when I built version one of this system, mm -hmm. um, I inherited a code base from um, effectively what the company already had when I joined and the the product that was developed was built for um, there were a couple of clients that the um, so there's a lot of history here. Um, this the, this product was being built for another company and the other company didn't want it. And then what is now the CEO and the C and uh, the CTO of the company that I work for. Um, they then took that product and started their own company because the company they worked for weren't interested in it. They couldn't kind of nice. find the value in it, essentially. Uh -huh. um, Good for him. <laughs> so what basically happened was they they took these kind of couple of starting clients, which were huge Fortune 500 companies um, that were doing, you know, they're basically household names. Uh, obviously, I don't want to name drop, but if I gave don't you care. the names of engineering. These yeah, this is engineering discussion. It doesn't matter, you know. Exactly. If I gave you the names of these companies, you would just know them, right? Everybody knows okay. them. But essentially, um, the net the result taxes. is. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> just... <laughs> go ahead. So the, the net result is these are these are massive companies. So we're doing uh, big big business here, and so it's it's obviously it's it's at scale problems, um, and obviously what comes with that is big businesses are fragmented and they have all these different systems and they just don't connect for whatever reason. So. Right. Um, the net result is that typically what we see from a given division, if you like, of such a company, um, if you look at the company on a whole um, for the like the biggest companies in the world, you're probably talking somewhere between about three to five million invoices a year. Wow. wow. Um, so if they're exporting their complete throughput for a single company, that's that's a lot of data and we're doing overnight processes for every client. So in reality, what actually happens is um, they take subsets of that data um, mm -hmm. and that's the data that they want to kind of, um, they want to get the best out of it essentially because of the nature of the, the process that we run. Again, we covered all this in our previous, so I won't go back into that, but essentially it saves everybody in the chain money by That's us right. doing this. Right. Um, so the bottom line here is that we've got some set of CSV data. We're going to build out an entity tree from it and each type of entity in that tree. So we've got an invoice header, we've got lines, we've got companies, we've got the references, and then we've got the buckets that they live in, which are just effectively join table rows. Um, and they effectively decide for us what the level of access is. So we've got to make sure that there's a specific order of events that must happen mm -hmm. both forward and backwards. So when you're creating and when you're tearing everything down again, and what we kind of didn't touch upon in our previous session was we talked a lot about transactions, but not a lot about everything that has to be in place before you can even begin to import a transaction, which is right. why it's been such a long time since we right. had our discussion. Almost Almost six months so, or more, yeah. yeah to yeah. give you an idea of what we've built, right, we've effectively built um, the basics of um, identity management. So instead of taking something like um, ASP.NET identity out of the box, mm -hmm. we've, built, um, we've, we've built our own standard compliant identity services effectively. 
this um, this Paul, this in itself is its own product, just so you know, which is exactly <laughs> like like you know what uh, you know you know what the identity server folks did. They went and basically made it not free, you know, and yeah. now people have to pay subscription for it, and it broke a lot of things. This is kind of a really really crappy move, especially if you start saying, "Hey, here is my identity server." This in and of itself, the fact that it's also standard compliant, it allows people to kind of extend it and expand on it rather than the complicated, you know, complex uh, identity server out there. But anyway, I'm sorry, I interrupted. Go ahead. Yeah. So uh, we started with that because obviously, again, we, we didn't talk about that in our previous discussion, but it was just, you know, we need a single sign on. Right. Because. I mean, it's basically a given with any enterprise product. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, there were also things like um, integration with things like Azure Active Directory, you know, Amazon sign-ins or Google accounts, you know, all that kind of stuff that ultimately does come up as questions, but we've yep. just never been able to like really kind of address them without going, oh God, this is going to be a ball ache because reason, you know. So we thought, well, actually, if we had our own kind of standard compliant basis for that, um, then we can come back and like, you and I can have yeah. that discussion. Say, hey, right, how can we integrate with, say, yeah. Azure Active Directory, which has what an OData API? Great, yeah. even better. Yeah, you know, we'll implement OAuth two as our standard in the standard, yeah. and yeah. then we'll just have a set of services that, based on the identity provider, can provide whatever is needed, and we can just plug in more providers as we go. So the foundation it's that. Paul, if you if you do it the way you're describing it, that's standalone and also plug and play into existing AD or Amazon or whatever is out there, this could mm -hmm. be one of the most important tools you'll build in your career. I'm not sure <laughs> you right now. Because right now there's nothing more complicated than security in the tech industry. Right? So simplifying it's, and standardizing. It's funny because I was watching people like um, David Fowler was was posting a lot of stuff about sort of identity management. And one of the bits of feedback that I gave him on Twitter was I want to decouple the act of authentication from the act of authorization, mm -hmm. because I feel that authentication strongly is the single sign on piece that nobody really wants to deal with. Everybody just mm -hmm. wants an out of the box solution for that. Mm -hmm. But in whenever you take any kind of um, authentication solution with that comes a whole load of authorization gotchas. Mm -hmm. And so my plan here is like the way that I'm modeling this out is to deliberately retire the, if you like the um, intrinsic connection between the two so that you can decouple them. And then through the standard, we can get that, um, you know, more granularity from it, essentially. I like this a lot. Yes. So that that was phase one. Um, yeah. Obviously, everything that we do is um, web portals, basically for our clients. So we had to rebuild what I call our core systems. Um, what we're basically in the process of doing with this is um, it's it's gone through a redesign, and our plan is to basically break all of this stuff down. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have these distinct systems. So we're going to have a standard compliant built content management system and a, and a separate standard compliant built document management system. And then when we build these products for our client, we're just going to consume all of that as one solution. Much like when you buy Office, you, you know, you get Word, you get Excel, you get PowerPoint. Yep, yep. And yeah. they're all pieces of the puzzle, yep. right? Yep. You never just need Word. You always need the whole suite. So yep. Yeah. We've kind of done that with our internal solutions. And then the bit that we've obviously talked about is this big, complicated bit that everybody runs scared of whenever I talk about. <laughs> so <laughs> what really is going on here is um, essentially, so the piece that we kind of glossed over is this master data piece. And essentially, the, the basic idea here is what we refer to as master data is these buckets, um, the companies and um, with those companies, you get um, what we call a, a source system. Mm -hmm. So when we receive this data as uh, CSV, there's kind of two types of CSV files that we receive, right? So we receive a master data file and a transaction file. So the master data says basically, hey, these are all our buyer and supplier companies. These are our references, and these are our and, and these are the official VAT references for those registered companies with their authority in, in you know whatever jurisdiction it is. Um, typically in the UK uh, and across Europe, 
um, any kind of business like this is done with VAT references. Um, mm -hmm. When you're communicating with, like, for example, banks, you have a VAT reference, yep. and then and then you have like an account reference, for example, yep. and then a transaction yep. reference, and the combination of the three plus some amount is yep. what you transfer essentially. Uh, so what we had to do is we had to start by building out the master data piece so that we could put in place um, a bucket tree and then into the bucket tree, we could put the various companies. Um, and so then we had a place to put the transactions. And what then happens is as part of our, our data import um, aspect of it here is we take the CSV raw data and that goes down through um, a standard cul-de-sac. So it's basic, simple, basic CRUD, right? Yep, you're, you're so sending an event and letting it propagate. Yep, yep, I'm with you. Not even that far yet. So it's literally, we're sending some CSV blob of data. We turn that into an array of basic CSV entities, which look much like the CSV data. Uh -huh. um, and we just stuff that into the database. Once we've got that in the database, we then do some further processing on it, which is where the cul-de-sac at scale and eventing comes into play. Okay. So, so here's where things. Oh, oh, I'm getting an echo. There. Are you getting an echo now? That's better. Okay. Uh, so, so here's where things get interesting. So, uh, what we're doing is we take. Um, if you can imagine that what we're receiving when we receive um, uh, companies is usually you're going to have a one-to-one -one relationship, right? So one line is one company with all of their referencing and other information. So what we do is we construct uh, from that by parsing it, um, we construct the entity graph, um, and then that's done by our company orchestration service, essentially. Or um, what we've been trying to think about, and this is where kind of the first of my questions comes out, is if you've got a scenario like we've got where you're receiving a raw blob of CSV instead of like a, a typical JSON request, there's yeah. this act of parsing. And to my mind, I thought that parsing, when you think about parsing, say, JSON data or parsing CSV data or XML data, most of the time these days it is one line of code because people have um, made some really helpful libraries and things out there. But in the context of the standard, um, particularly for what we do, like the basic act of um, parsing CSV data, for example, is a fairly trivial function. Um, we wrote our own parser because there's some configurability about it so when we talk about csv people often mistake the c to mean comma comma mm -hmm. separated variables that's what I thought. yeah that's what i thought mm. yeah so the, the common meaning as i've learned to understand over time is that the c actually stands for character oh. and if you think about csv files as being character separated files um, I did it, not know that. <laughs> Does that yeah. mean, but wait, if that's true, well, you have the TSV, which is tab separated, and you have a whole bunch of things that is specific to the character. Maybe, maybe you're right. I, I, I don't know. You know, I mean, is tab a character? It's not, right? So this is why <laughs> it's a TSV, right? Yeah. Oh, dude, I did not know that. I thought it was comma separated. Everybody called so, it this way. The reason why I bring this point up is because we get um, clients who are sending us CSV data and inside a field, they'll have a comma separated list of values in a single CSV field in the row. Inside, like the one cell? Oh yeah. my God. Well, how do you know? How do you know it's the beginning of another cell or the end of the current cell? Like, how do you know? Exactly. So what you have to do is you have to specify. And the way that we allow our clients to do this is we allow them as part of a, the query string when they make the request to say, hey, my field separator is not actually comma. It's a pipe or a semicolon or something like that. Uh, but so you make them pass it in, as a query string in the URL. We have a default, but they can override it. So we can say, okay, well, we're going to accept the, I don't know, let's say for argument's sake, the, the default is the semicolon um, mm -hmm. for field separators. They can then send us a pipe separated file. Just, just, just be careful because if you make it in the query string of the URL, it's not going to scale. It's 2,024, 20, 20, 84 characters. 
long. You yeah. can't go beyond that. <laughs> we're, we're, we're talking about a query string parameter that can and will always be a single character. Oh. We parse it as a character and we say, okay. hey, you can you can set that to whatever you want, but it's one character. It's just one character. Okay, yeah, that's yeah. cool. So so let me so 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 you wrote a parser that's gonna sit behind a broker. So a yeah. controller is gonna have to parse that. I, I see now in my head like an orchestration service that takes your request, parse it, brings it all down to the broker, the broker parses it, brings it back to you as a strongly typed model, and then you event to that. You send that as an event. And then exactly. call to sack your way across your whole your whole architecture. So you're basically saying, "Hey, I have data. Whoever wants that data, go ahead and go parse it." So you're basically kind of publishing an event, and you're saying something came in. And I think that's is that what you did? I don't know. I think that's what you did. Exactly. Yeah. So we took the parsing problem away from. I, I kind of think of the um, the cul de sacs as standard. Is if you think about the the, the, the default stance that you want is you've got some entity type of, you know, let's say type of T, um, which for that you've either modeled, say, a database table or it's coming from an API or it's coming from, I don't know, files or folders or something like that, right? Mm -hmm. So for that, you want CRUD functionality. So that's your basic starting point for designing any cul-de-sac. Mm -hmm. Once you've built multiple cul-de-sacs of that nature, the way that you interconnect them is through eventing, essentially. So this is where we come to cul-de-sac at scale. Now, when we originally modeled this out, I drew cul-de-sacs the way you drew cul-de-sacs, which was mm -hmm. left to right on the screen. And I've kind of turned that because the way that when I've been explaining this stuff to people, I've been getting a lot of pushback because I'm like, oh, that they don't quite click didn't grasp it yeah that yeah. it's actually still just an n tier architecture that what we what we essentially have here is n tier where in the top you tip your request in and at the yep. bottom is always your your database that yep. stores everything essentially and all you're doing is there's this yep. this stack of layers essentially yep. yep so if you think about kind of each cul-de-sac as effectively a stack of services with um, a controller accepting some kind of HTTP request and a broker then mitigate, mitigating is probably not the right word. Um, uh, I was going to use the word orchestrating, but it's not even that. It's um, acting as your kind of um, abstraction layer to say, hey, you're now crossing a boundary between the internal and the external. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of everything above that, but after the controller is effectively the standard compliant business logic. So everything mm -hmm. between controller and broker is expected mm -hmm. to always meet the standard. Yep. And so what I've been, what we've done is we've essentially had to, <laughs> it's kind of a pain in the ass, actually. <laughs> we, we've had to take um, our entire entity graph um which for us um you know the stuff that i've modeled here although this looks you know when you when you scale at when you zoom out and you look at this you think oh god there's a lot of stuff here right it's actually like yeah if you don't know the standard you'll see this you'll be intimidated but if you yeah. understand one pattern it's nothing but a replication of that pattern which exactly. is what, it's fractal you're just you just it's like looking at the universe oh my god this is so complicated but it's mostly just a bunch of galaxies and a bunch of solar systems and planets and moons at the end of it you know so i'm sorry go ahead mm -hmm. yeah i mean once you know what the definition of a solar system is you can just say hey a galaxy is just a collection of solar systems <laughs> you know and you know what the universe is well it's a collection of galaxies how hard right. could it be right right <laughs> So, yeah, I mean, it, it's much the same. And and I think that, you know, when you get to kind of like your or my level in, in your sort of career, when you start looking at things as a senior, you start to think less about individual lines of code and more about patterns and practices as a as a kind of diagram. Because, you you know, when you look at each of these boxes, you know, you think, oh, God, there's a lot going on here. But realistically, I mean, if I just, you know, zoom in to say just this portion on invoices, you know, 
I can take, oh God, I'm doing a U now, you know. <laughs> Here you go. Let me show you this, you guys. <laughs> you know. <laughs> oh God, the infection has begun. <laughs> yes, I... Contamination. <laughs> I'm turning into the sand mark too, right. <laughs> there's no longer invoices, there's just a, that thing. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, <laughs> that thing. <laughs> So my goal as a as a kind of um, if you like internal monologue, um, I it's not really documented anywhere in the standard or anything. But what I've kind of said is, hey, if I look at any one of these, um, so think of each of these boxes as being a class, you know, a, you know, a C sharp class. And when I look at each of these, uh, if I see more than about say 150, maybe 200 lines of code in total. I look at that and I go, it's doing too much. Mm -hmm. What what have we done? You know, why have we got that much code in there? Um, and this is what's led to things like me identifying that, for example, parsing was a separate function that needed to be ripped out. And historically, yep. when I had this kind of end-tier architecture without the standard, I would have just built like, you know, a CSV import oh, just service. Put it in there. Yeah, exactly. Yep, yep. It yeah. would have been a single class. It would have done all this parsing. It would have done all the processing. It would have raised all the events, and it would have all been in one big class file. Now, I might have used partial classes to break that out, but again, to my mind, it's still one still class. Big monolith. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So the the thing with the standard is that not only does it say, "Hey, you, you've got to break things out by your entity type," but within your entity type, you've got to break things out further because there's different kinds of processing that you're doing with your entities. So your foundations are about your, your kind of basic processing. You know, you're you're not expecting much more than very simple That's foundations. Primitive. Yeah, they're dumb, basically. They're, they're, yeah. By the way, just so you understand, foundation services are semi-disposable, just like brokers, because they still know about the exceptions that are coming from your um, external resources, right? Your real mm -hmm. business logic starts at the processing level. This is why they're called processing, because that's when you start actually using the muscle that matters the most. Moving data around, any clown could do that, you know. But now start doing something interesting like verify item has changed, which is something that we use in Git file, right? We go and say mm -hmm. verify verify the Git, that pull request has actually changed. What are you looking at? How do you make that determination? It's going to get you to just sit like this. Here's the thing. Brokers and foundation uh, uh, components are just grunt work you're just using muscle no brain at all right start yeah. doing processing and orchestration you're going to be sitting like this like the code is that little <laughs> but the amount of brain power is that much right so because it's categorical responsibility not just do one thing at a time or something like that but anyway i'm, I'm sorry Andrew. by the way just just so you know just while you're talking about this you just you just popped up a new idea and i know i'm gonna have to do it this weekend um <laughs> So you know how back, back, back in the old days, we used to use something called triggers in databases? Oh, God, yeah. Do you remember that shit? Okay. Pain in my existence. So, so now I have an idea, Paul. Um, imagine if I could add a new layer on top of the entity framework that say, listen to a change in a particular model. So, mm -hmm. when, so when you change a row in a student database, I can register a function. Mm -hmm. So I can pass in a function, just like just like the cul-de-sac, you're registering an event, right? And it, when, when the event comes, so imagine this, you're registering a function, and when the row changes, I can trickle a whole bunch of events, just, just like that. How about so, that? See, that's it, why I like to talk to you, because you make me think about shit. But then again, I'm it, gonna have to do a lot of work. But anyway, go ahead. It's funny you say that because I looked you at already this. already do it, sucker. <laughs> okay. uh, I looked at this, right? Yeah. And I went, why do I have uh, a whole cul-de-sac here? And when I actually look at my event services, what I've got is I've got some object down here, mm -hmm. which is the, the whole Agents, kind of yeah. branch yeah. left thing, which has gone yep. and handled by another library, essentially. Yep. Um, Callum's done some excellent work on that, by the way. Um. But then when I look at any of our event services, any location, anywhere in the in the code, they're literally just passed through calls. So I was yeah. thinking there has to be some precedence somewhere that we could, in the standard, we could say, okay, um, either in brokers 
um, probably not brokers because we don't want business logic in them, but maybe yeah. something about the foundation services right? where we could pass in what would get effectively be an event broker. So we would class it as a support broker. And then when anything happens as a basic sort of CRUD operation level, we can say that's how we handle eventing. There is that. And there's also, do you see that guy? How do you say your name, brother? Is it Etienne? Do you have a camera and a microphone? This, the, um, oh, yeah. How do I say your name, oh, brother? Etienne. 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 <laughs> so, yeah. so Etienne, Etienne has been talking to Christo. You know Christo, Paul, right? Christo, the yeah, two, yeah. he's the guy that's been pushing, you know, standardly. By the way, Etienne, like, so, so I just saw him and I remember, do you know what Christo is proposing? Proposing that our foundation mm -hmm. services expose an event on add and on update and on modify. Yeah. So you have methods and you mm -hmm. have events and you but, use, you yes. use the traditional version of an event. You use C sharp events. Now, this was where I started. And yeah. I think you raised some queries about it at the time. You were basically saying, hey, actually, an event is a is a complex thing. It's um, if you look at, for example, the way that we've implemented eventing, if you, the way to think about an event is you've got some pointer to a thing that's going to happen, uh, um, effectively a method that you're going to call. And what, it, what it's going to do is it's going to trigger a list of handlers. So it's a simple thing from an interface point of view, but it's a complex thing under the bonnet. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, like the act of raising a C-sharp event and having something that's actually built into the language already solve that problem for us, it makes sense for us to um, define a part of the standard that allows us to say, hey, let's leverage that, right? Because... I don't know any kind of programming language that doesn't have some concept of being able to raise and handle events. Like I can't think of any that you not know. not not that cleanly, not not in this clean way. Yeah. So there is, so that, and it's really scary and weird. Like I've seen people kind of subscribe to a calm object, you know, and basically say, "Oh, just listen to this magical thing that's happening in your operating system." I, I don't think I can sell that to to anybody including myself <laughs> yeah. <Lucy. laughs> that's that's alice my youngest alice yeah sorry i can't see in the dark it's a little bit older but no trouble what are you doing are you stealing my water cooling kit off my old machine <laughs> trouble she is hey. <laughs> Uh, so, like events, they change the flow of any video. It's like, <laughs> she, she needs like that, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so I identified that myself because I looked at that and went, you know, when you zoom out anywhere where you've got this branching at the uh, orchestration level here, anywhere where you see this, mm -hmm. I think this could be simplified into just a straight stack and then. You know, following your mantra of it's art, it's even more simple. Yeah. Because then all diagrams are just a straight flow. So then you can say the standard says it's it's a one to one straight all the way down. Um, which at the moment it's not necessarily. You know. If you make your if you make if we do, I, I'm not sure yet. I'll, I'll take your screen for a second, Paul. But if we do what Christo is proposing, mm. I'll take your screen for one second. Um, so if we actually do. What the heck is this? I don't even remember. Anyway, so so if you do, this is your controller. Let's see. Let's imagine it together. Controller. You're pushing down to some service. Let's say this is some processing service. And then you pushed into a foundation service. And then you want to go all the way down to Sorry about that. Stories, and then some broker. So if we do what Christo's saying, the world would start looking something like this. Like this guy would be the same offerer of the um, the events. So on add, on retrieve, right? That will save you a broker. The problem with this approach, and this is what I said to Christo though, the problem with this approach is that 
you're leveling the play field. You're basically saying you cannot receive events as a foundation service anymore. Everything has to be from processing onwards, which might cause a little bit more um, uh, restriction or additional work needed. Because now what if I just want to listen to the event at the foundation level and that's it, right? So I, I, I think he, ha he I think he ha he's up to something because... First of all, if you think about it, though, um, you, you can't handle an event in a foundation service ever because um, oh, right. a yeah. foundation service should only be doing basic operations and arguably handling an event is going to be a more complex business operation. Always. So, so wait, how do we do this today? Today we go and say, no, you can't do that. You basically want to go and say, oh, in addition for you to do this. You're gonna need a an orchestration service sitting on top of all of this. You know, Crystal might be up to something. I'm just worried that our foundation mm -hmm. services become too busy. In that case, like, um, so so basically, he's saying, okay, send this like that, and then you will have like another thing for the events that will go like that, and then something else has to sit on that other side to be able to listen to this. So something else has to sit in here. And another thing has to sit in here to listen to this. Actually, so, sorry, it would be an orchestration service. So see how much. So this is going to go back all the way back like this, and then it's going to hit over here. The one concern would be, so it would be like this. See, so his model, this, this tiny model in here, saves all of this work. Um, shouldn't that be some orchestration service at the top? Yes. Yes, sir. Only Just thing I'm worried clarity. about. Yep, 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 absolutely 100%. So, Paul, the only thing that I'm worried about in here would be that now your foundation services are starting to become busy. And then his proposal was that, well, why don't we uh, uh, break the foundation service into the core operations, but also do a partial class for events? I was going to suggest that. So yeah. in much the same way that you do exception handling and you do validation, you, you could say that, um, you know, having a partial class definition that says this is where I'm going to put all of my events. Um, then you have a method to raise an event and then you have some mechanism for subscribing to that by actually exposing mm. the event. Um, then anything that sits on top of it can effectively do both. So, I, um, so do you think that makes do you think that makes the foundation services too busy? What do you have to say? All of you, question for everybody. I don't think no. so. Uh, I had a, I had a chat with with Christy about this yesterday because um, we were talking about the front, like well, we were chatting about unity and how in the MVVM scenario because th this is actually kind of the same thing with data mining. You, you're mm -hmm. subscribing a UA, uh, a UI component to a data model, a view model, whatever, and that thing automatically updates without you worrying about it. Mm -hmm. so where traditionally you would have referenced the UI component, set its value every time mm -hmm. something comes. But I mean, we can use that in the same scenario like this. But I would, I, I wouldn't sit in the foundation. I would, I would put it on something on top of it, like processing service or something. But and by as the way, it exposes those events, yeah. Was there anything you know, have anything else bind to it? By by the way, guys, Etienne is trying to bring the standard to Unity, which makes me very very happy because the way how Unity is implemented yeah. today, yes, well. it's crazy. I don't understand. Yeah. It's too complicated, you know. So he's basically yeah. saying, "Hey, dude, I love Unity. I'm gonna bring the standard to it." So I I would totally get on board with that. I really <laughs> want to have another crack at my Voxel engine. And if I could write it to the standard, that would be nuts. Dude, dude, what do you think? Oh, guys, yeah. what do you think is running on these devices? Unity. Unity is running in here, running these experiences. So if I yeah. can bring oh my lord, I I don't even know. I That's only awesome. met yeah. I only met ATN like three minutes ago, but you know, I think it's great. <laughs> I like the experience. Anyway, okay, so it's so, a so question because this could be a standard upgrade. This could be, you know, uh, 2.4, you know. So you guys are saying this is simpler. If you actually allow your foundation services to also 
expose an event. But but just just so you understand, this is not always the case. Sometimes the event is completely separate from. Okay, here's the deal. You know, just so you understand, that means that your foundation service is going to have to keep track of these things. You understand? Can I, uh, mm -hmm. Go ahead. Can I just ask a question? Which is, was it? I understand. I guess was it. So when you look at it from an architectural point of view, I definitely agree that it would simplify things. Mm -hmm. But my question is more of a point of purity. So say right. one day, one day I wake up and I want to use Mongo instead of EF. Now I probably need to build on top of my Mongo foundation to support this new eventing that everybody seems to be on the craze about. Mm. Whereas before I could have easily swapped them out and yep. been none the wiser. Yeah. Was it the main pro of this new approach is obviously everything becomes a lot more, I guess, was it compact? You can tightly integrate. So now you, I don't know, instead of having an invoice event service, I can say, well, actually, if I just grab my invoice service, my invoice service will tell me when it's been updated, which for most people will make a lot of sense to that, I understand. So I definitely get the appeal. Yep. My point is only more a point of purity. Yeah, you know, do I have to constantly build on top of my foundations to wedge it into this architecture? I did not even think about that. You know, I did not even think about the idea. You know what, Paul? He's right. You know, he's basically saying if I'm if I'm gonna throw away my foundation service today, and I want to replace it with something else, and I want to kind of push to the to the same event, you know, everybody that's subscribed to this is none the wiser they don't have to worry about that the event will happen anyway it seemed to be a lot more pure and a lot more single responsibility-esque surely that um so this is where i differ a little bit with your views on the bottom of the stack here mm -hmm. um, um because what i've done is underneath the the broker which is literally just passed through calls there's no business logic at all Mm -hmm. um, so what our brokers typically do is they construct um, a data context. So at the moment, we've got entity framework in there. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, nothing stops us having some kind of dapper context or Mongo context, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but the from the uh, foundation services point of view, it's just calling a method on an interface. Um, and then once it's made that call internally within the foundation service, nothing uh -huh. stops me then raising the event. Uh -huh. So does it matter if the thing that I'm sat on top of from the other side of the broker is SQL, Mongo, Cosmos, some file system, some API? I would argue not. But there is a difference here between the way that you do things in the standard and the way that I do things. And I think that's probably worth a whole conversation in its own right, because mm. I deliberately digressed for this separation reason. I wanted to be able to say, hey, in the event that um, we just didn't get on with Microsoft SQL anymore and we wanted to use Cosmos, right? Um, I wanted to know that for sure I could literally just replace that context object and potentially, I might have to change some code in my brokers, but I definitely wouldn't have to touch my foundations. And you have to. So, how, do, how do you do with the exceptions? Do you throw your own exceptions? Uh, so the way I, well, the way that we do exception handling at the moment um, is we actually don't really catch much by way of exceptions. Um, and it's kind of a deliberate choice. I allow it to kind of trickle all the way up and then it gets captured by a global exception handler unless there's some specific exception that we're interested in. That's um, that's, that's going to bite you when I start rolling out rollbacks. Because yeah, absolutely. you're letting the exception go, go all the way up when your foundation mm -hmm. service could be the one kicking off the rollback before yeah. the exception passes through. To the next so layer. in the event of a rollback, you could easily argue it doesn't really matter what the exception is. If if an error has happened, then you just perform the relevant operations to do the you know thing in reverse. No, also no, because you have to roll back with some errors and you have to allow it to go forward with others. Like for instance, yeah. I'll give you an example. Like if you're getting if you're getting a SQL connection exception, right? That there is no rollback here. You roll back against what? 
You know, you, you can't even talk to the database, right? Versus you're getting a conflict exception. So you actually made it to the database, but the entity could not get persistence. You actually have to roll back from there. You know, this argument of putting the exceptions all the way at the top, that's 99.999% of the .NET community and every other community that they do. But watch when I roll roll the rollback standardization. People are going to be like, oh, shit, you know, we did it wrong because now we can't roll back. You know, we have a problem, right? So anyway. Yeah, I kind of take the view of, like, you make a HTTP request and then you perform effectively a business operation, which is kind of a chain of internal things, you know, events. And if any one of those fails, you attempt to do whatever rollback you can do. But if you can't even roll back, then obviously, what do you do, right? You just bomb out. You, th you throw an exception, and then the global exception handler catches it, and then some administrator is going to have to pick that up and do something with it. But like well, in, your, in your case, let's say you, know, you get halfway through um, creating a series of entities, and then the SQL server goes down. Mm -hmm. You can't roll back anyway. What you can do potentially is uh -huh. put the rollback event onto something like a service bus, and then there when SQL go. Server comes back up, you can right. handle it. But you don't know about it. And also, if you put the exception handling all the way at the top, how are you going to test drive that? Well, I am. Um, so the, the way that I was looking at it was I was basically saying, thinking that um, at the top of my stack somewhere, um, mm perhaps wrapped around even like so as potentially as middleware um which would be a a standardized library i okay. would wrap that around my um request handling so what i would do is i would take that failed request effectively if anything failed in it um that i kind of cared about so to speak um and then i could stick that into the database or or somewhere you know, like on a service bus or, um, you know, a Redis cache or something like that. And then later on, reattempt the operation. If the, um, the caller sets some flag, say, in the request, or if I determined through business logic, through programming, that it was a, an event that was worth retrying for some reason. Otherwise, I just return some, you know, fault code or something to the client to say, hey, I couldn't do your operation. So, and you'll, be, <laughs> and you'll be able to return 409, you know, 424, 421, 423 yeah. or, or through the middleware. So you're going to have to define all of that in one big giant. Well, you know, it would be it, obviously it would be a service, right? So what I, what would happen is the middleware would call into like an orchestration service and then off it goes. <laughs> okay. The standard. <laughs> okay. Okay. That that was my theory behind it, which is why I think that you know exception handling, um, if the, if you're actually going to handle the exception, i.e., do something with it, by all means catch it. But if all you're going to do is wrap it up and then return some new exception, I kind of don't get the point in catching it in the first place. If that makes sense. If if your orchestration or coordination services have to make decision halfway, which is the next wave of the standard of upgrading the standard you're going to have to handle exceptions, you know, within your services. But I'll let you see it. Callum, you you, ha you had something to want to say. You go ahead. Mm. I was going to say, um, was it? I've forgotten kind I of forgot. by this point. <laughs> but I imagine when you're on the topic of like, was it, I guess, event-based decisions. Uh, if you had like, was it, I guess, because I suppose this, the way you could validly roll back while being connected to the database, to my mind, is, I don't know, suppose you get halfway through some business operation and then you decide, you know what, this was a bad idea. <laughs> so I don't know. It's suppose that, yeah. that the first time that the, I don't know, so in our case, offers. Mm -hmm. And so what we have is a pot. And you say when you accept an offer, you take money from the pot. Effectively a rainy day fund, but applied to transactions. So what happens when the first time it asks the question, you know, do I have money in the pot? And then it turns out that actually further down the chain, you realize you never had money in the pot. And due to some weird database or caching issue on client side, you've now just accepted a bunch of offers that have put the client into debt. Yeah. It wouldn't be a very ideal, obviously. So a simple way right. you could, could keep track of, um, was it, I guess, the events that have taken place since and then roll back them. That way you don't have to necessarily worry about database transactions because as I understand it, it seems like database transactions can affect a lot more operations than just the one set that you're interested in. 
if that makes yep. sense. Yep. By the way, hmm. that is, databases are just made way too powerful at this point where you can add validations in the database. You could go and say, you know, this cannot be null and this has to be in a certain range. But I really, really highly advise against that because you can't test drive it. You can't rely on it because there's no test. If there is no testing, there's no logic. It's just like that. It's just as simple as that, right? I think of exception handling as decision making, selection. It's business logic in a way. But anyway, Paul, you were going to say something. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. Exception handling is, and, and like I said, if if you're actually handling it to to do something, then yeah, I think it adds value. But if if all you're going to do is just wrap it up and then throw it, you know, into the next layer, then I, I don't see that you're you're really adding anything. But to to add to that point about you know, databases and validation. Well, it, that's literally what schema is, right? It's right. Let it's me, defining what's valid. <laughs> so let me just get this from you guys. If if there is a layer on top of the entity framework, like a library outside of the box, that basically tells you, hey, this event has happened. This row has been added. I can see a potential in this. I can see a real value into because i could i could do one of two things either go to tell jeremy lickness he's the uh he's a principal program manager on the entity framework team you know and see how long they're gonna take or just go do it myself it's gonna <laughs> be one of the two right it depends on I, how I reckon we could do it i reckon we could do it and it wouldn't take that long i, I should, reckon me and cal could knock that together in a few weeks but i think I, no. go, ahead, go ahead go ahead go ahead Go ahead. I think we've already um, solved a problem like it already, Paul. With um, we have. Pure... We? Um, <laughs> That's why it... I'm so confident here because I'm like, I <laughs> like, know what oh, you're thinking. Totally go do it. <laughs> but, <laughs> if, if you recall, um, that DB context offer logic we added in the um, current production stack <laughs> that currently just sits there, albeit it's very specific right now. But if you actually took some time to think about it, I imagine it'd be quite easy to generalize as a concept. This is so. So just so you guys know, there is this library that I'm building right now, and it and it might be something you've already thought about. It's called uh, Levant, and this library is just a, a precursor to um, to uh, Lake U. And what this library does is that it's basically gonna go and say, "Hey, generically speaking, I'm gonna allow you to go and register." Here it is. So you're basically gonna a, uh, uh, a, a register a listener and then you're going to basically publish and that listener so you don't have to have iteration in your broker you know if you have multiple listeners to the same event i'm making it a library right which is sounds like whatever is the event hub that you guys have today unless you mean by event hub something living in the cloud what do you mean by event hub paul when that little orange box that you have in your let, let me switch back to paul so what I was thinking about here is essentially, um, is yeah, essentially, what is this guy? yeah, yeah. It, in the event that um, the way that you're raising and handling your events is through some service bus layer. Uh huh. Um, oh, so you want to put it in the cloud? You have to be cloud foreign, my friend. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. In the event, <laughs> kind of funny language, but in the event that you are, um, whenever you raise raise and handle your events, you're doing so through Service Bus, you're uh -huh. going to have some kind of event hub that you notify of the event having been raised. And then the, uh, the Service Bus will potentially, say, trigger a HTTP request, which is triggering your handlers, if that makes sense. Okay. Um, back on your Just API. Okay, just so you know, this library that I'm building would allow you to either save events or sh publish events to a local running instance, or you can configure it to go to the cloud. So when you want to test an airplane mode, you don't have to have an Azure account or an AWS account. Well, That's what cloud. Yeah, sorry. Is. I had this. I had this weird idea that like where we do cul-de-sac at scale, we go down a cul-de-sac, we come back up and then we go down a different cul-de-sac, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of doing that, go down your cul-de-sac, raise your event, and then your thing that holds your event registrations knows how to construct a request to a different endpoint, which goes down a different cul-de-sac. Well, yeah, I had, um, was it? Then, so then you have no connection between anything. Everything is just a straight stack. 
So the only piece that's complicated is that standardized piece that deals with your event subscriptions. Well, that's why your event broker is. It doesn't matter whether you're coming from the top or from the bottom. You still need to hit that core business logic. Well, Paul, right. um, Go on. Was it, if you recall, um, was it one of the ideas I had for the event library I had built was to let you, I guess, was it specify the provider? Because obviously, as we know, sometimes it's more advantaged to have a in-memory event queue because you may want to perform a bunch of operations first. Other times you may prefer to actually have a cloud-based event queue because, as you know, as we found the current production stack, when you have load balancing, so many instances of your API, they could potentially be doing lots of your work for you. So this was one of the ideas I had regarding our transactional imports, which we've discussed yeah. before. So we hit this weird scenario, Hassan, where, yeah. um, so you know I was saying, we receive transaction lines. Um, every transaction line in the CSV file has a reference on it, a transaction reference, and it has a type. So it, they'll say, oh, okay, this is an invoice, and it has reference 001, right? Okay, so if you've got 50 lines that all have reference 001 and they're all invoice, mm -hmm. they are invoice lines. So that's a 50-line invoice, and mm -hmm. we compute the header information for a 50-line invoice. You could also argue that that's one event per line to do a yeah. basic CRUD add for yeah. an invoice line. Yeah. In our case, because we're receiving a cut of our client system daily, that invoice may already exist in the system. So we don't even know if it's an add operation or an update yet. We just Upsert. know we received... An upsert. Do it's an not, upsert, yeah. Do you yeah, not remember um, the um, 27,000 line already? So, yeah, <laughs> this is where I was going with it. So we had a client that um, they did all this regular testing with us. Uh, they went live, and then they sent us a single payment file that contained a single payment in it with 30,000 lines on it. Oh my God. And our system, our existing system, not to the standard, went, what do I do with that? And it generated <laughs> one giant EF transaction. And EF oh went, God. yeah, no worries. I can generate 100 megs worth of SQL. And it gave it to EF. And EF gave it to SQL. And SQL <laughs> went, give me a minute. <laughs> <laughs> The day if they started adding for a raise, it's like it's time to go on vacation, boys. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I remember posting that in uh, your Discord server yep. at the time, yep. and you were like, "You're insane, man! I know yep. business servers that would hate you." And I was like, "Yeah, there is your yep. servers. <laughs> <laughs> we so, abuse us here. <laughs> we're going on strike." <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah, I told you, you are pushing it forward, but, uh, you know, um, Paul, maybe the idea of registering a controller to, to an event is not too crazy. It just won't make sense when you explain it to someone because you have to kind of, do you remember when we were younger, do you remember these Nokia phones with the snake going up and down like this? If that snake's head suddenly appears from the top, it just doesn't make any sense. You know what I mean? I don't know how to explain it to you, but that's the best I could think of at the moment. You know, you're going to have... Uh, the way to look at it is it depends yeah. how you're handling scale, right? So if, if, for example, the thing that you're handling can be handled internally and chained internally um, as, as part of the same, if you like, um, uh, compute process, then you're all good. But if you want to take advantage of the fact that um, your application is running in the cloud, you've got, I don't know, 100 instances of that because you're using Azure App Service and it's, you know, it's properly running at scale. And you want to take advantage of all 100 of those instances for this particularly complicated compute event. Um, then the only way that you can realistically do that is to rely on the next tier above that, which is, um, you know, the inherent uh, load balancing that you get from being in the cloud, right? Mm -hmm. So what you're doing is you're taking the act of having to write thousands of lines of code out of your code, and you're saying, hey, load balancers have been built for this job. Let them do their job. Um, well, however, it, it does much like, for example, when we deal with entity framework or when we deal with something like the OData framework, it does create this inherent kind of black box problem 
where you look at a thing and you say, well, this is going to go and magically solve the problem, but I don't know how. And that, right, right. for me, is the only thing that makes me think, oh, this is probably anti-standard because everything about the standard is take that really complicated problem, break it down and make it really yeah. visible and easy to understand. So, yeah, yeah it's, it's kind of like, well, where, where do you go? <laughs> right, right. Well, I mean, was it if you wanted, I guess was it, you could say some events are in memory. So I would argue if you wanted to parallelize um, that RA these days, I would say you'd insert the bare minimum. You need to get that RA in, so the buckets, the header, yeah. and the companies, yeah. maybe. Was it they are? They tend to be few rows, so at most you're inserting 10 rows, which I know SQL in the past has inserted quite quickly for us. Now, the lines, however, you could argue is actually a cloud generation, or sorry, a cloud-based event. The problem that we have is the fact that you have SQL Server, which has foreign key restraints. And the reason right. why I bring this up is because, for instance, if you then wanted to delete 27,000 lines performantly, you could argue, well, actually, I can delete the header really quickly, but cleaning up these rows is going to be quite a demanding task, so I may see the value in load balance on them. And that led me to the question of where do we stand on cascade deletes? Because right. if you're using something like SQL Server as your backing store, and in our case, if you've got that big transaction, which has one header row and 30,000 child items, the, the arguably one. the simplest way to do it from a code point of view is to just delete the header. SQL does a cascade delete and yeah. all the children go. Yeah. <laughs> but there's something about that. I, I personally do no action on cascade deletes. And there's yeah, a I do. For that. I, I like to maintain control of exactly right. what's going on. Right. Yeah. Because if, if one day mm. I go and switch and use Cosmos or a no SQL, no uh, ref referential integrity based technology, I'm screwed. Because deleting one thing is not going to think about this as a distributed system, right? What's the biggest problem? What's the biggest trade off with microservices architecture? you lose your data integrity, right? You could have a completely different microservice with a data store that says, oh, I am a record that belonged to student one, two, three, but student one, two, three in a different store is gone, right? Which brings people to start kind of doing hacky things like, uh, what do they call it? They call it uh, reconciliation. So they write a service on top of the microservice architecture to go see if the data makes sense across, across the board, you know? Uh, and well, then you end up with bugs in your reconciliation code and all hell breaks loose. Yes. Um, Been there. Have... <laughs> Good answer. <So>, uh, <laughs> I have a question related to this problem, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I was discussing with Paul shortly before we got on this call is an invoice header is linked to a source system. A source system is basically an entity with a string ID. So my immediate question then becomes, how do I check that the source system is valid within the current architecture? Because I can't check it, I guess, was it within the invoice orchestration service, to my mind, because of the system is a different entity. Well, so, think about, so think about, okay, I'm, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead first, come. So I guess, was it the more abstract question, I guess, is how do you actually do um, foreign key checks? Because it's not really documented in the standard as such. I mean. Was it gut feeling is that you can put in some wonderful logic into your broker, return true or false, which is what Paul suggested. But I felt that would lead to a lot of um, going, you know, entity exists logic in your brokers. Paul putting logic in the broker is going to get him in trouble. I'll tell you that much, you know, sooner <laughs> rather than later. But that's not what I said. Okay, oh. okay, okay. But, but I'll tell you this much, though. Like, if you, the way how I, I, I imagine this problem, uh, is that you will have some orchestration that talks to a service that goes and says, go check the validity of this before I continue to move forward. Like assuming that this is a parent entity service and this is a child entity service, right? In your case here, this is a child request orchestration service called Entity Request Orchestration Service. The one thing I could think of is to go and talk to that parent uh, entity processing services or service and go and validate and verify before you let go of the persistence process. And this is why I like this, because 
in in this pattern here, you're basically going and saying whether you're relying on a relational model or you know you are working with a like assume that this guy is calling an, an external API. So this is an external API. So your relational database safety is gone at this point because it's not going to tell you whether that entity even exists or not. So I would add in a functionality in here that says verify parent is valid. And this guy throws an exception if it's invalid and you know it's a circuit breaker. It basically goes and says invalid parent exception and then cut down. No, the it's so imagine you've got like an invoice header line and it has some foreign ID. Yes. Yeah. He, yes. What he wants to check is that the foreign ID is a thing that that user has access to and can associate that that um, invoice header to effectively. Okay, so you're just validating if the current user has access to this uh, invoice uh, header ID, right? To the system. To the system, right? Yeah, we're, we're basically saying if I attempt to insert this row into the database, mm -hmm. is this foreign key relationship going to exist? Satisfied. Right. Yeah. The same thing, the exact same thing. Instead of me, whatever the validity rule is, go ahead. Go ahead. So, so is your um, solution to basically just orchestrate the two related services? Mm -hmm. So what happens when you have, um, I guess, something that could potentially be related to many things? Because an invoice has the system on the header. You then have company references in the company's collection. Mm -hmm. You have references, again, which have a system ID property as well. Mm -hmm. You also have the lines which have a currency ID property. Um, when we get to our 10th level of coordination orchestration yeah. services, <laughs> we'll be good. <laughs> uh, right. Audit trail for the invoice is also related to the user. Yes, you could grow. This is exactly what I was talking about. Like you could grow this way uh, uh, vertically, right? Yeah, but then the more, you the more and more entities you have. So you have twos and threes and twos and threes. I'm assuming if you reach nine different entities that means you have only three orchestration services and one coordination service that's one way you do it or or you could go and say no i want to scale uh, 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 horizontally, horizontally right through the eventing right now your eventing could be one of two things if these entities are dependent on each other like like the problem that you described if it's if it's like this one dependent on the other, one dependent on the other, like this, versus the other scenario, like you basically have a header and then there's an invoice and there's maybe something else and then there's something else. If something breaks here down, down that stack, you need to throw an exception and start rolling back up to that chain. Yeah, right. that was exactly kind of where what I was thinking of. Right. Like you you would raise some sort of like, uh, let's say, an invoice validation event, and right. anything that had a stake in validating an invoice could then handle that. And so, so if none of them threw an exception and the event was successfully handled, right, you could then go ahead and perform the business op. So that's one way I would do this. The other way is the horizontal. You go and raise events, just like Paul was saying. That you raise events. This one here. This model that I'm talking about here, this is the kind of greedy model where you go and say, I want the answer right here, right now, immediately. Someone is waiting on the other side and I can't just asynchronize, you know, this, this process. It has to happen here and now. I'm assuming like if you have more than nine entities that are dependent on each other, maybe we need to talk about your domain model. Maybe your domain model has something that's more complex than it needs to be. Maybe you didn't have, maybe you have too much normalization in your, uh, in your so domain design. If, in the case of our entity model, if you think of a transaction as being um, about five different entities, right? Mm -hmm. um, so an invoice is a set of five entities. A, you know, example is a different set of five entities. And then you've got something like a remittance advice, which is a payment file, which is a different set of five entities. Mm -hmm. When we receive CSV lines, we mm -hmm. can receive lines that are marked as any of the above. Mm -hmm. And then we generate something that we refer to as an active transaction, which is effectively an unpaid item in the system. <laughs> and it gives us a, it gives, yeah, it gives us a flattened view essentially of, of mm -hmm. that transaction as a single, if you like, header row only information. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and we do that for all of the kind of outstanding items. So the net result here is that when we receive CSV lines, we could potentially touch 20, 25 different tables in the database, ultimately. Um, so so here's, here's something else for you. You know, you said five entities, right? Mm -hmm. Five entities, right? So there's also another thing. You could do also, and this is something I haven't talked about much before, um, I don't even remember the last time I, I did something like this, but uh, you can totally go and say, uh, I want my orchestration or coordination service to validate the pipeline. What that basically means is that you're going and saying, check with every orchestration service whether their entities are in a good state to, pr to start this process. <laughs> Effectively, I'll, just do your check ahead of time. Yep, you're basically going at, you're sending scouts, basically. You're basically going and saying, go out there and tell me whether the current state of this request and all its, uh, you know, the processes that are going to happen underneath that are valid within that particular constraint. There's like 50 different ways you can do this. It becomes interesting when your orchestration service is doing some selection logic. It's going and saying, if it's that, then do this, if it's this. So probably this is the best thing for your case. If you have like five different entities, you could literally go and say, it, it would literally look something like this. You could go and say, here's my uh, orchestration service. And I am sitting right here and I'm basically going and saying the my coordination service is going to sit like this, five entities. And this coordination service, before it starts to do anything, it will send one request that say validate, validate request. And this is not just, remember, we said like validation is structural and logical and external, right? This is logical external validation when you go and say, hey, ensure that this process all the way downstream is valid before I start kind of persisting data. Yeah, I suppose one of the issues of this is surely it leads to, um, was it, I guess you you end up with orchestration services that just become pass-throughs to their child services, or I yeah. guess orchestrations of orchestrations. Mm -hmm. does, does that not therefore mean that you end up going, crap, which one did I forget to call validate on later down? <laughs> I'll tell you, it, it's it's so simple. This one is responsible for calling validate on its children. This yep. one is responsible for calling validate on its children. And then this one is responsible for calling validate. It's a, it's a basic, uh, uh, what is it, a, a tree tree logic. You start from the leaves all the way up, from the branches all the way up to the, to the root. This is yeah. a very basic algorithmic problem, right? Because uh, yeah. as you've stated, there are two ways you could look at this, right? You scale vertically, which is orchestrations of orchestrations, or horizontally, you raise your events yeah. and you say, right, any of you got a problem with this event? <laughs> there, uh, there's, there's, By the way, there's also the hybrid piece where you are in some places. Actually, let me show you this in real life. Here's an example. This is from uh, this is from Git file. This is how we're doing it in here. Watch this. We're, we're working on modernizing our compute. See, there is a situation where you go and say, this is my, let me expand this a little bit. So this is my queue. Look, this is your classic uh, uh, vertical approach. And then you're going and pushing an event down the queue through this event top. This is why I'm building this Levent library, basically. Right? So you will run into situations where you go all the way up to a coordination, but from now onwards, you're flat. You're basically going horizontally onwards, right? It's up to you, but you can you can literally scout out the results before you start persisting data. Thank you. Yeah. My thinking is that I guess the goal is always the same, right? All of your logic ultimately lives somewhere below an orchestration service mm -hmm. and what you're essentially doing is finding nice ways to connect and stack those services together and it really def it boils down to like structurally how you want to put those pieces together um, mm -hmm. what i don't want to do and i think um me and callum have had this conversation a lot in the past is 
we don't want to end up with this kind of like old school pyramid type structure that you end up with where you've got like you know <laughs> 10 different layers of orchestrations because you need to bring so many different things together so as i was saying with like our csv line imports right so uh, an individual line can be declared as being an invoice line which is part of a set of you know that line will be broken down into five different entities but then the very next line could be marked as a credit line which is a different set of five different entities and, and that's okay but just hear me out on this things that are harder to write can be easier to read and that's the ultimate goal like software is three different kinds right there's hard easy to write hard to read hard to write easy to read hard to write hard to read like pearl you know anything <laughs> that's written in pearl is just a disaster right i have yet to find something that's easy to write easy to read but that's basically what we're trying to attain to in the standard so you'll find yourself if you're writing standardized systems you'll find yourself doing a lot of work at the beginning but when you try to maintain that system it's like drinking water it's just really simple. It's a walk in the park, right? Because you already have all these components in front of you. This goes back to this model that you have in here, right? It's very hard to design. A lot of hard work that you put in there. But when you try to maintain it, it's really, really, really easy. I think a lot of engineers fall into that trap where they go and say, well, it's too much work. Yeah, but long term, you'll be able to maintain the system. Do you know that this is how factories work? Factories, when they do hardware, when they design hardware, they make it really, really, really simple. They will print and, and uh, 3D print and, and manufacture 50 different, you know, uh, AND gates and OR gates and whatever they're designing their uh, processors. So it's easy to go and maintain these because once it's there, it's there. <laughs> it's not going to change. That's why it's called hardware, because it's hard to change, right? But um, I digress. Yeah, unfortunately, we don't get the net benefit of that with software. <laughs> <laughs> but it should be like it. I mean, we're just simulating the real world, but it's, it's the same laws that apply. Yeah? I like that. I like that a lot. That's exactly how you're simulating the real world, right? The more likely you are to bring things closer to the real world in your software, that's modeling and simulation. That's really what it's all about. You're extracting something from the real world and putting it into a machine. You know, I think we might have, you know, in, in some of the software that I've seen, people be like, oh, let me just do this one utilities library or commons libraries or helper libraries because it's going to make things simple and easy for me it's easy i'm going to get it done in a day but then come back later and maintain that good luck you know that's the problem that's easy to write very hard to read <laughs> you know there's no logic there's no rhyme or reason for it believe it or not i've seen some systems where one file of code has 27000 lines who the heck is going to maintain that? I always no, know. <laughs> Can you believe this? <laughs> Go ahead. Is that all? <laughs> <laughs> I knew um, some people at my university who didn't believe in the point of function, so they would just copy and paste their code. Just put everything in one function, right? That's how you do it. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I wonder if they were just actually compilers in disguise. <laughs> <laughs> I once had a junior ask me, what is the point in creating classes and breaking things out into methods when it's all exactly the same logic anyway? The CPU is just going to run it. Nonsense. Why would we do that, Paul? Why are we doing yeah. it ourselves, you know? Why the do computer you doesn't care. Classes? So <laughs> The computer doesn't care. Why should we? It's kind of like, was it going, why should I cook potatoes? I'm just going to do the same thing anyways. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, I heard this once. I said, you know, the someone said this a long time ago. They said uh, uh, software engineering is about writing code that humans should understand and only coincidentally for the machine to understand. And that's very true because if you can get the humans to understand what you're trying to say, you know, then getting the machine to adhere to that, that's the easy part. You know, you can configure that out and, you know, kind of produce the right binaries to run this code. Um, 
anyway, you know, I, I guess bottom line is um, just consider thinking about validating the pipeline first. It could help you a lot. You know, it could help you a lot and it could save you from this rollback, but you're still going to need rollback because even if you validate the pipeline, mid-process, the database went offline. So the process that you just validated a minute ago is invalid because you can't actually connect to the database anymore. So you still need rollback. <laughs> so there's one, I guess, saving grace with this is the like, so what we receive is basically a raw string. And we effectively do, if you think about how, how parsing CSV data works, it's basically a string dot split, mm -hmm. um, you know, for, for each line. And then you take each of those individual values that you end up with in your array and you just stick them into different properties in an entity and you stuff that in the database. Mm -hmm. So one of the obviously defining um, ongoing rules that we've had since day one is whatever is sent to us as long as it's kind of structurally possible if you like mm -hmm. uh, in any way shape or form it goes in the database as the raw csv entities mm -hmm. and then what we do is we query those entities back out and we raise an event for each reference that we've got essentially to construct and then import an invoice or a, a credit note or whatever it is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so what that means is that we do have the benefit of being able to sort of handle the request, say, yeah, great, we've received your data, um, but we don't necessarily have it imported yet. Mm -hmm. um, but it also means that if we so choose, we could say, okay, for each invoice that I'm going to construct, I'm going to construct the invoice. And like I was saying earlier, potentially just make a new API call to insert that invoice or mm -hmm. upsert that invoice. And then it's just a standard requests then right it, it becomes like a basic crud operation almost so the the problem gets a lot less complicated when you look at it that way um however yeah i would like to find a nice way that we can kind of um it can be done so efficiently that effectively it doesn't matter if a user has constructed that file has put you know fifty thousand lines in it and they're sitting there waiting for it because it's only going to take 10 seconds to do it anyway that's my goal. Um, you know, when I first, when we implemented the very first version of this, uh, this whole process from going from received set of data mm -hmm. to um, transactions being in the system, um, we were processing about um, about a fifth of the data that we process today for some of our biggest clients. And the process was taking approximately nine hours to complete. Mm -hmm. um, nowadays, um, with our current data load, um, pretty much every import process is done in under 10 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and that's with our production stack, which isn't currently to the standard. I'm hoping that with the uh, improvements that we're making architecturally with the standard, and from what I've seen from unit testing, um, you know, we can generate anything up to about a thousand transactions with up to about a hundred lines per transaction. So we're talking what a hundred thousand lines potentially. Nice. Um, line items in a single test um, and those line items get broken out as i said into about five different entity types one or two lines per entity type so we're talking what half a million rows um, and our tests at peak are lasting about 55 seconds so this is a testament to you know what the standard is really giving us here and yeah. we're not fully optimized yet we're not fully leveraging everything and those are kind of best cases but i think that realistically you know um we're not using anywhere near that kind of like maximum throughput because no no company on earth is that big so the fact that we're able to cater for that it means that you know if we have 100 clients all hit us at the same time we can still can handle, handle them yeah. yeah yeah and so that's like the goal that isn't it uh -huh. yeah yeah um, but yeah, I, I think there's still much work to be done. And like I said, I, I like the idea of leveraging things like externals, you know, moving across processes. So service bus architectures, leveraging load balancers in the cloud, that kind of thing. But what I don't want to do is obviously from a standardization point of view, it's very difficult, like you say, to explain to people, hey, you're now going to leave the process and then something's going to come back in. And that's part of what you're diagramming out because like you say, it's, it's very difficult to explain to people how that kind of architecture works. Yeah. Um, whereas if everything is completely internal and you can diagram out 
that entire internal flow it it does make things a lot easier to understand but it does limit the amount of technologies that you can leverage if that makes sense that's right i agree so there's some pros and cons <laughs> let's let's touch base again you know uh we're almost an hour and a half in but uh you know i'm i'm, I'm gonna stop you before you make it another five hours you know although that Although I have to tell you something, I didn't feel it was four hours. We kind of were five hours. We kind of went through it real quick, um, which which means it just shows me that people are engaged and actually invested into what they do. This is not a job. I don't think you're doing this as a job, Paul. You know, so um, you you don't actually have to do any of that, but you do it anyway. Uh, I'm not paid enough for it to be classed as a job. <laughs> never are. We never are. I think money isn't a job. Yeah. <laughs> That these concepts, the things that just you, just you understand, the concepts that we develop according to the standard is something that I'm planning to take to the next level. Like I was searching yesterday, you know, what are the biggest problems our world is facing today and how can we use software to kind of leverage that? If, if it's standardized software that people can maintain, imagine taking these concepts and ideas and solving big problems that we're dealing with today. This is how I kind of this is your self-actualization, Paul. This is you reaching out to the level where you go and say, I am really, really good at engineering. How can I take that hammer and destroy bigger, bigger problems for people that I will never meet? Right? This is the whole I idea. I can only aspire to be a good engineer one day. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh -huh. By the way, you keep calling yourself a senior, but in my book, you're a principal engineer. Just remember that I said that for where it's worth. You know, oh, because a, a senior engineer is someone who you know, gets an existing requirement or a project and designs it and implements it, you mm -hmm. are creating the requirement. You are finding the project. Mm -hmm. So that's one level up, right? So uh, just, just keep that in mind, just in case I decide to hire you one day, you know, at <laughs> least you know your offer. <laughs> yeah, it's weird because um, like we work for a very, very small company. Like, you know, I, I've talked about the sort of big business that we do, and it, it sounds impressive when you explain it to people. But, um, you know, we are a very small company, but what we're doing, um, because we're working for big companies, you know, it, it comes across as a big thing. But as a result of being a small company, it means that we have this kind of many hats problem, which mm -hmm. I don't know if you've yeah most people have heard of the mini hats problem. Any, anyone that comes anyone that comes to work with us here in the US from Europe they become a kick-ass engineer because you're you're wearing all the hats you're doing it mm -hmm. all right and i don't think engineers get paid enough in europe i think it's laughable honestly but anyway that's that's a that's a story you know given given feel, that feel free to tell the boss that yeah <laughs> <laughs> i'll give you his email address <laughs> <laughs> me and callum would appreciate it <laughs> by, by the way just just so you understand just one thing to kind of wrap up with um so, so, you know, I have my also my own external business, right? In addition to my daily job where I just treat it like a social club. I just go say hi to people and play around with software, sometimes some video games and then come back. Um, I think I think the best compensation model for software engineers working on a project is that the feature that you develop, you continue to make money out of as long as requests are going through your code. Do you understand? So let's say you are building a system. Let's say you're yeah. let's say let's say you're building a system for people to subscribe to a system like Netflix, right? Every time a subscription goes through, it goes through your code, it touches on your code. There's something, there's a concept that I'm trying to implement in Git file called regionalizing. Like how much of that pipeline did Paul implement? And based on that much, you get paid that much forever. Like the code that you write once, it continues to pay you for as long as it's working. Do you understand what I'm saying? Jeez, now let's say awesome. we hired let's say we hired Callum and Callum came in, Paul percentage was like 80%. Callum came in and said, Oh, that piece is not really up to speed. So let me change that. So you go down to 75, Callum is at 25, and now you're sharing stream of 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 revenue that's coming in. It doesn't, doesn't make uh, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Doesn't that turn us into salesmen battling for commission? <laughs> I, I, I guess so. I guess so. In a way, in a way, it does. But I'll tell you this: whatever that is, it's better than the state of the software engineering industry today. Today, 
you know, mm -hmm. I hire you to build me a feature. I give you 50, 70, $100,000, and then I go make millions out of it, right? That doesn't sound right to me. You know what I mean? Like your, your, your genius, your code, because you have to understand, like when you write a piece of software, you're putting a copy of your brain into that software. Like this is how you would handle this transaction. So you put a copy of yourself in there. You should continue to get paid based on that copy. And I think this model is a lot more fair. It's a lot more effort and contribution driven because I've seen places where, you know, you have five. It's a whole new meaning to the term hyperthreading, doesn't it? When you can hyperthread <laughs> out a piece of your brain. You get out of, of thinking it out. <laughs> Off you go, brain. Go solve this problem in parallel all over the planet. <laughs> Brother, I've seen places where you have like a team of 20 engineers, right? And there's two people that are doing all the heavy lifting, but everyone's getting paid the same. That doesn't sound right. Mm -hmm. You know, anyway, that's just a story for another day. That's the, the political aspect of the standard, right? The more financial and political aspect of the standard. This is where we're going to say, wait a second, there's some injustices that are happening you know, in terms of compensation and how people are, you know, kind of being rewarded and all that kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's yeah. all, it's all contribution based. You know what I mean? It's, it's almost like going into the whole decentralization of things, you know, right? Like in a, in a working environment, the project and you exchanging your time, that, that's all, like you said, that's software, that's actually your property or oh, someone paid you for it. But that software should make you money. Like yeah. If if you can work, if you can if you can every hour you put in work pays you like it, it's kind of like increasing An your income stream. Yeah. And yeah, it's I think I think I think you will get a lot more developers and you'll you'll grow a, a way better culture in development. And and like collaboration, like open projects and there's more incentive into it. And, and right. if you build things out that way as well, you'll be able to see that like the rich people in our industry are the people that are actually running the world, you know. Mm -hmm. Like so, like um Tim Berners Lee come up with HTML, you know, you'd expect him to be like a multi-millionaire. Nope. And then <laughs> the poorest but he's in debt. He's in debt. Exactly. This this is what I'm saying. Like his foundation literally, literally yep. runs the world. Yep. <laughs> yep. You know, someone like someone like <laughs> someone like Dennis Ritchie. This guy should be the richest. It's in his name, Ritchie. You know, but you know, <laughs> yeah. you know it's, it's supposed to be it's supposed to be the richest man in the world because he invented C. That's yeah. everything is built on top of C, right? And yet the guy just, you know, he died with like a couple of jackets. In his in his closet that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. here's the thing from a financial this is i'm gonna put on my entrepreneur hat here for a second you know from a financial standpoint when an investor comes into a project they put in money and they expect a percentage for that money right you're putting in effort that should be exactly the equivalent of putting a percentage in the project and you should be compensated yeah. accordingly does that make sense? Yeah. See, see how this is working. <laughs> I like anyway, that. I, I'm gonna make software engineers the richest people in the world. You know, I'm, I, you know, I'm on a mission. You know, to ensure that software engineers, you know, get compensated proper. You know, uh, and uh, here, here I go. I'm, I'm watching too much Aussie man. So now I'm speaking like him. They gotta be compensated proper this time. <laughs> you know. <But, laughs> anyway, listen, guys. I, I have, I have to log off, but. I appreciate the conversation and let's keep this going. Paul, I want this to be a regular thing, like at least once a month, you know, we can yeah. kind of get uh, to touch base and see where things are because the stuff that you're working on is really, really important and very interested. Uh, I'm interested in it and I want to see how far you can take it. Uh, but more importantly, I know, again, I know behind the scenes, we, you know, we've talked about sort of, some of the code and things that I've written and, you know, I've, I've given you code snippets here and there and you've said, Hey, there's, there's some things that we yep. should probably change. So I think that, you know, there's definitely some value in us like breaking this out into other sessions where we actually get right into the nitty gritty, because I think that's what people really want to see. Right. I mm -hmm. mean, people want to actually understand 
like from the questions that we're seeing in the community and things like that, you know, people are saying, well, how does this part of it actually work in, in mm -hmm. practice? You know, they, mm -hmm. they don't just want the in theory and the diagrams. They want to say, hey, OK, now that I've got the diagram, I've got some design. I've got some idea of what it is I'm building. I know what the kind of standard looks like. What does that look like in code? Yep. And I think that, you know, your OSSS example, for example, uh, you know, it, it covers a certain amount of it. But when you start looking at like really enterprise stuff here, whilst because of the nature of the project, I can't share the whole code base and yep. open source it because of, you know, intellectual property rights. Yep. What we can do, however, is we can look at very specific cases and we can look at how we've implemented certain yep. aspects of it. And some of the things that we're talking about today, you know, where we're saying, hey, we could take different approaches to stacking services together. Or why don't we just model a few up and then we actually look at the code that we've written and we can say, hey, how does it perform? What does it look like from a testing point of view? What does it look like from a programming point of view in, in each of the classes that we've built? You know, how are they handling? Why are they handling things the way they are? Why have I, for example, made some decisions um, as the principal here to yep. actually not follow the standard exactly? You know, did I make good calls there? Let's question some of those calls. Or is the standard in a position where it could potentially evolve from that? You know, have I learned some lesson here that the standard doesn't have yet? Who knows? But I think, yeah, there's definitely some value in us um, actually digging into yep. the code at some point. <laughs> More importantly than all of this, it's just trying to bring the every engineer out there in the world to agree on some sort of a contract. See, yeah. the stuff, see, this is the thing, your gotchas your aha moments, right? Like the, the, part, the part where you find in a, 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 a new thing. Now, this goes back to a collective and a hive mind that's mm -hmm. helping people everywhere. Everywhere. Yeah. Right? yeah, classic example. Like we were talking about eventing earlier, right? Yep. Imagine you've got five event handlers for the same event. Is there precedence here where we have to specify that there's an order to the mm -hmm. to how an event is handled like one, mm -hmm. one of the conversations that me and callum have had is when we delete an invoice mm -hmm. if you delete rows in the wrong order you don't have access to the rows that remain mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so it raises other questions things like this nobody ever talks about um security yep. is another good question you know we yep. we touched upon that at the beginning and, and sort of single sign-on identity problems and how we handle like users and roles and things like that authorization authentication all these different uh -huh. pieces but uh -huh. yeah there's, there's lots of these like kind of little gaps or sort of areas that like when people talk about programming patterns and practices they talk about kind of the standard as a whole but they don't talk about how all the pieces actually tie together and and i think that those are the things that are really going to help people yep 100 percent, 100 percent. anyway listen friends you know i i need to take a break before the od decision but uh you know i appreciate you all um uh etn etn Am I saying right, Etienne? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Etienne, you know, we need to, uh, I'll, I'll try to set up something with you either tomorrow or Monday so we can talk about how we bring the standard to Unity. Uh, this is yeah. this is really, really, really interesting because here's the thing. The gaming industry is bigger than the NFL, the NBA, and Hollywood combined. That's insane. Like, it's like it's like it changed changes everything. If we can bring standardization to that and make developing video games in a standardized, proper way, easy and simple for software engineers, this is an impact I haven't even been thinking about, brother. Like, you know, you are you are such a blessing. I don't know what to tell you. You know, just, just coming up in there. And I also thank Chris. He basically went to Christo and Christo said, Listen, man, I'm not a front end guy. Go talk to Hassan. Maybe he'll he have some answers for you. You know, this is this is also something yeah. about what this standard community is about. You know, we're kind of yeah. um, pointing at each other. Yeah. You we know, should hey. touch bases on that because um, there's a pet project yeah. that I've had for some time, and I put it down because I couldn't get the performance out of Unity that I wanted for the code that I'd written, and it might be that I wasn't leveraging Unity's features correctly, or I'd written code poorly. Um, but actually, since picking up the standard, maybe there's a good opportunity there for you to do some stuff on your end and then me to kind of test what you've done, essentially, by rewriting my own projects. Yeah. We can kind of come together. And then when I hit problems, I can share it because it's a pet project. Mm -hmm. We can completely open source yeah. it, do it out in the open in front of everybody and sort of see how it pans out. Yes. 
Okay, mm -hmm. listen, yeah. listen. You know, Sunday, five p.m. And by the way, eighteen is in South Africa. Like this, this just this one yeah. call is just connecting three continents, just like that. <laughs> so I, I love, I love the internet. I love the internet. You know, as funny as this might sound, the internet still blows my mind. Just the fact that you can talk to people a thousand miles away, you know, just like that. I know people be like, so what? Not a big deal. It's a big deal to me, especially having Wi-Fi in an airplane. Like, imagine this. You're sitting in a chair in the sky connected to the internet. <laughs> I don't think people – like, hold on a second. You're sitting in a chair in the sky sending a signal to a satellite that's coming back to you. Like, I, I, I don't know. Imagine, <laughs> imagine <laughs> trying to explain that to a person 100 years ago. Like they would, yes. they would be like, no way. This it's is like magic. Well, yeah. Didn't Einstein yeah. try that? <laughs> yeah. And they still don't get it today. They're still yeah, unpacking it. Yeah. But I always find it fascinating how you have the internet and anything that moves, just because if you think about it, you've got a signal that goes somewhere sent to, I don't know, a cell tower. And somehow, despite you traveling at 70 miles an hour, it makes the way, it makes its way back to your phone. Yep. I, 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 like how? Like I, <laughs> I like I know how, but it's still like surreal to me. Like I know how you like you know the details, you know, and still like fax machines. I knew how they work. Just the fact that you put a paper and it comes from the other side, you know, with the same writings on it. Anyway, <laughs> I'll talk about that at some point in time. Thank you all so very much. Paul Callum, Etienne, thank you all so very much. Uh, Etienne, maybe Sunday, 5 p.m. South Africa time. How about that? Sounds yeah? good. Okay. Yeah. We'll talk about unity, bringing the standardization to unity. That would be great. Great, great, great. And then we stop talking about unity and think about game development in general. That's something students in schools ask me about all the time. To them, if you write code, do you write video games? Automatically, yeah, yeah. one to one, it's like that. Basically, learn programming. Yeah. <laughs> That's what I learned. I told myself from a young age. Has Unity adopted some um, .NET six yeah. yet? Unity on .NET six? I don't know. I don't know. Were they still running that old? Because they they were running on Mono, weren't they, at one point? I don't know if that's, that's yeah, changed yet. I think I I need to go check, but I think they did bring in one of the latest or um, like C sharp support. Yeah, I know there was talk check. of them adopting .NET Core when it was like C Sharp. No, it's not fully. It's not fully up to date. Yeah. Uh, hmm. we have been we've been watching the Xamarin blah. No, nothing public to report yet. They're still running on .NET five, even though it's out of five. Support. Yeah. Well, five is fairly recent. It's not um, bad. It's yeah. out of support, but it's not bad. I'm just curious because, like things like um, Link, for example, is ubiquitous. It's everywhere in C Sharp code, right? And like in .NET 7, they're talking about how they've got massive improvements because they're doing some underlying changes to that kind of technology. Mm -hmm. So when you've got like, you know, 100,000 components in your scene in, in Unity, curious to see like, you know, I know that they brought in some different mechanisms though. Instead of using the component stuff, you can use these other things now, but it's been yeah, a while since I've played with it, yeah. to be honest. Dots, full dots, yeah. It's like parallel processes. And, but it's not, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I haven't actually used it. But we'll, yeah, we'll, be interesting. We'll, we'll try it out. We'll see if we can. And if Unity doesn't want to play along, we'll create our own gaming engine, right? <laughs> Do you know, I'm all for that. I'd love to build a Visual Studio add-on that gives you the Unity scene viewer, and then Visual Studio can just become your IDE for yep. game development. I, I'd be totally fine with that. I am and with totally things like that, hot, that hot reload, you could yep. run your game whilst debugging your game, whilst writing the code oh, yeah, in your yeah. game. Come on. I, I this love this that. is like prime time. I love that he's saying whilst. It's just 1918 right there. <laughs> 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 anyway. Listen, listen guys. you. <laughs> us Brits, I've told you this before. Us Brits well, know the language better than you. <laughs> of course. Absolutely. You know, sure. <laughs> <laughs> but, but can you say standardization without using an S more than one time? <laughs> you can't. You just can't. <laughs> anyway, li listen, guys. Thank you all so very much. Let's let's connect uh, Sunday, Etienne. I'll send you the link. 
you know. And if you can't make it, that's okay. I'll find you. I'll find you, and I'll find you. Oh, and I'll send you the link. I'll you know, you, down. <laughs> you know, and and we'll I'll, we'll get this out of the way. This is such a such a great venture just to have the community. It's like I'm it's like I'm in a long running hackathon, you know. And people are just trying all kinds mm -hmm. of ideas, and we get to use some of that uh, at work and all that. Okay. And of course, you know, people watching, you know, I hope you find something useful. You know, we talk about a whole lot of things. I know that when Paul and I talk, there's a lot of like underneath underlying foundation and things that we talked about in private. And now we're talking about it in public and people maybe know what we're talking about or not. Feel free to drop questions, drop comments in the comment section. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, and don't forget to like and subscribe. Thank you all so much. Thank you all. I appreciate you all. And I'll talk to you later. Take care. Bye. Cheers.